Hello everyone, my name is Nati Cohen and I'm a solutions architect at AWS. And today, after lunch, uh, we are going to try and talk a little bit about, uh, sorry, about clock synchronization and why you should monitor your clocks. So, since we are at DevOps days, um, I'm going to uh, skip the basic parts. Um, so, clocks are essential and you should monitor them, right? Um, so several things will start to work if you don't monitor your clock. Uh, for example, some security tokens won't work, uh, like Kerberos, or if you try to use the AWS uh, API, you would get these type of errors. Um, and this is because we are signing our requests and we want to prevent retransmission, um, and so we use time in these. Um, in addition, your application, if you're using timestamps on the server side, you want to have an accurate clock, so your analysts and BI people will be happy when they look at the data, and they won't run around the office with sorts. Um, and finally, in our observability stacks, um, in our metrics, in our logs, in our tracing, we all in all these places, we need accurate timestamps in order to analyze things that happen later on. So we get to the first takeaway pretty fast. Um, monitor your NTP client and make sure it is synchronized to some clock, right? There are different NTP clients. Um, know yours and make sure it's synchronized. Um, it's not enough to have it running in the VM you provision or in the server you provision because over time it can lose track of its name server, uh, sorry, the time server. Um, so it's really important to monitor and make sure this is still happening. Um, and for a very long time, uh, I thought that's enough, right? Um, until two years ago when I joined AWS and I started to see more customers with more use cases. And for some of them, this is not enough. Um, so some customers or some uh, companies uh, have time-sensitive applications. For example, they take a timestamp of a financial transaction and they need to compare it with some third party um, and they need to say think about how accurate this timestamp is. Some customers have compliance and regulation needs and they need to be diverged from UTC by that amount of milliseconds or even microseconds. And finally, one of my customers came to me uh, with this type of architecture where his user would go to the cloud, which will then go to some special devices in his data center, go back to the cloud and to the user, and they take logs from both places, and they wanted to uh, say things about the timestamp of these logs and the relation between them to know what happened first and what happened afterwards. And so in order to uh, answer these requirements, uh, we, ne we need to learn a little bit more about how time works and how timekeeping works in computers. So let's start from the basic. What is time? So the, probably the older and the most uh, intuitive time standard is the universal time, or UT1. It essentially looks at the Earth's rotation, and that's a day. And we can divide that by the number of seconds in a day, and we have a definition of a second. However, this is a bit hard to measure, so another standard had to be devised, and this is the coordinated universal time. So coordinated universal time uh, tries to be easily measurable, but within uh, one second distance from UT1. And the way we do that is with atomic second, and atomic second is based on the radiation frequency of the change of state in cesium-133, it's measurable, um, and it's pretty accurate, um, except we need to fix it a little bit uh, from time to time. Um, and in order to do that, every six months, we decide if we want to add or subtract a second from UTC, and this is called a leap second. And as you probably imagine, software really likes leap seconds. Um, it's not. <laughs> um, terrible things happen like almost every time we have a leap second. Uh, my favorite one was 2012. I had like a really large Linux cluster and all the machines stopped working uh, when the second was added uh, because of a bug in the Linux kernel. So hopefully we won't have many of those uh, coming anymore. Um, okay, so now that we define time, how do we keep time? Okay. So in order to keep time, we need some sort of a frequency reference. We need to know that a second has passed. And historically, we would do that with something like a pendulum or a spring. 
Uh, but putting this in a one U server in your data center probably won't work really well. Um, so instead, uh, we are using quartz oscillator which are uh, crystals that are finely cut and they use something called piezoelectricity uh, and they are pretty cheap and get really accurate for the price um, in terms of UTC. Um, pretty accurate means that they lose something like a second a day, but for most use cases, that's enough. And if you need to be really, really accurate, uh, you can use atomic clocks. And these can be used either with cesium or rubidium, and they will set you back a few thousand dollars uh, for a small atomic clock. Okay, but what about computers, right? So in computers, uh, we have different hardware options. Um, the first one and the most popular one is RDC, which is essentially quartz oscillator with a battery in a single package that resides on your motherboard and it can survive power loss. And we have TSC, which is a counter in your processor that is being incremented on every clock cycle. And then out of that, you can define a second. Um, there are for VMs, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, we have virtual and power virtual options. Um, in order to avoid all the VMs, go to the hardware and come back. Or in order to hide things like uh, the TSC is being measured in each core individually, and we want to um, smooth that. Um, so we have these virtual options. And on Linux, you can actually choose. So uh, if you uh, go to SysDevice System Clock Source, uh, you can see the available uh, devices that you have, and you can pick one. Um, and this can help you trade off performance, how much time it takes to get the time, um, sorry, <laughs> and accuracy. So, um, Okay, we know how to measure a second, but how do we actually get the time that we want to keep, right? So for that, we have clock synchronization. And for clock synchronization, there is another standard, which is at the heart of UTC, which called International Atomic Time. Uh, the abbreviation is from French. Um, and this is essentially UTC without the leap second, and it's being uh, measured by a weighted average of uh, 400 something atomic clocks in 80 laboratories around the world. And it's being delivered to you uh, over a satellite, um, for example, over the GPS constellation, uh, the US one. And actually a pretty fun project to do uh, is build a GP uh, GNSS receiver at home and get accurate uh, millisecond accurate time, nanosecond, sorry. Um, and this is mine, right? It's built with Raspberry Pi and a hat and an antenna I got from AliExpress. Um, so you probably ask yourself, why don't we put that in every server? So there are some challenges. Um, the antenna need to have a sky view. Um, so first one, uh, there is intentional and unintentional jamming. Uh, unintentional is like bad weather. Intentional is not in the scope. Um, there is the cost, uh, and uh, virtualization, again, makes it a little bit more difficult because we would need to uh, allow different VMs to get to the hardware, and we don't like it, and so on. So what do we do instead? Uh, we use the network time protocol. We use NTP, um, and NTP uh, works in layers. Uh, we have several uh, servers that are connected to a time source, to a satellite that has an atomic clock in it and gets the time from all these laboratories. And the first layer, layer zero, um, are the satellites, uh, and we call these stratum in NTP. And layer one is the server with the receiver that receives time from the satellite, and so on and so forth. Right? And the protocol itself is pretty simple. Uh, we uh, tell the server, uh, I want the time, and the server gives you the time. And what we do with that response is uh, we assume uh, that the round trip from our client to the server is symmetric. And then we divide it by two, so we know how long it takes to get from the server to us. And then we can calculate uh, what's the offset of our local clock from the server's clock. OK? Um, OK, so now that we know how NTP works, uh, we need to talk a little bit about where it uh, doesn't work. Right? So where the inaccuracies can come from. So if we have a server that is synchronized with some time source, um, it can have 
several different types of inaccuracies, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those. So one of them is the local offset, right? We talked about the protocol. We can be off from the server that we synchronize from. So this is uh, simple, right? And then there is the timekeeping, right? Remember all these devices that we talked about earlier? They are inaccurate, in each in its own way, and we need to account for that as well. So timekeeping is inaccurate on our server, but also in all the stratums that don't have an atomic clock, right? Until we get to the satellite. Um, and finally, there is that symmetry, symmetry symmetry assumption, right? We assume that the time it takes to go to the server from a network delay perspective and to get back to the client is symmetric, but it's not what happened in real life, right? Um, in real life, there are queues, uh, many, many, many queues <laughs> everywhere in the kernel, on the network card, on the switches, on uh, other devices. There are middleware, uh, IPS, IDS devices doing things to packets on the network. And so uh, it, it's not necessarily symmetric. Um, and so we also need to account for errors here. And <clears throat> we have several ways to avoid some of these inaccuracies um, in NTP. So for the local offset, we, if we keep our NTP clients synchronized, they will take care of that local offset, right? They will do it gradually and safely and sanely, um, and it's configurable. Um, for the uh, inaccurate timekeeping, uh, we can decide how often we pull from the server. So the more often we pull, the less inaccuracy we'll get from our local uh, timekeeping, timekeeping device. Uh, but here we need to be a little bit careful because if we'll pull too frequently, uh, we can get like very odd offsets or we can get throttled by the server. So we need to play with it and choose the right um, uh, period to pull in. And finally, uh, we can minimize the network delay from our computer to the stratum zero by choosing where we synchronize from, right? So a common misconception is to choose um, a network time server uh, with a lower stratum, uh, but this is uh, usually not the right thing to do. So think about it if you are a stratum 2 and the stratum 1 is over the internet, this will be more inaccurate than if you are a stratum 3 and all the layers above you sit with you in the same data center and have lower network delay, right? Um, so need to be mindful of that. So now that we know how time works and how NTP works, uh, we can uh, talk a little bit about how to monitor them. Um, so what we can do um, is we can try to bound the error. Uh, so the bound uh, is the local offset, uh, how much we, uh, how much offset we have from the server, um, the root dispersion, which includes uh, the timekeeping uh, inaccuracies, but also includes other things that we don't have time to talk about today, and um, the half of the round trip, right, um, all the way to the root. And the root here is the stratum one. Right, the receiver. Um, all of these values are available in NTP clients like Corny, and you can take them and calculate the error, and you can bound that. You can bound the error of your clock, and then uh, you can send it as a metric to your metric system and act upon it. So by acting upon it means that you can change the time server you look at, you can evacuate that server, you can evacuate the data center, you can stop the application from running if the time um, it is too, uh, can have too much error in it, right? Uh, but at least you know, uh, and this is probably the important part. So um, another takeaway, um, first, monitor your NTP clients. Um, it was super helpful and most of you probably already doing it. Um, and then if you have a business need for that, also monitor your clock error bound. And we have a really nice blog post uh, that will guide you uh, to how to do that, right? How to monitor the clock error bound. Um, and now that we have that clock error bound, uh, we can start maybe to think beyond timestamps, right? Um, so instead of taking timestamps, which are um, a creature that we can't compare to other timestamps because we know this timestamp has some error and this timestamp has some other error. So we can't really say which happened before which, right? Instead, 
if we can take that error bound, we can look at a tuple of the earliest timestamp and the latest timestamp. And these tuples, we can compare them. They are very accurate, right? Um, so if the latest of one timestamp is before the earliest of another timestamp, then for sure it happens before. Right? Um, we have a nice open source tool called Logbound. It's on GitHub. And it will help you programmatically uh, from your code uh, to get the clock error bound. If you want to use things like that, and these are pretty useful if you're trying to do to build like a distributed database, right? Um, but it, it it can also be used for other things, and it's a top one. So, um, but for now, please uh, monitor your clocks. Thank you so much.